Hello, and welcome to this presentation on statistics. We're specifically going to look at data collection and presentation methods. This is really a recap, and it does assume you have some understanding of statistical tools and techniques. Here's an overview of the content of this video. Approximate start times of the various sections are shown. So the presentation commences with a brief overview of statistics. Then we consider representing data using percentages, pie charts, bar charts, and pictograms. Next, we look at the types of variables. We define discrete variables and continuous variables, and also define the term population and sampling. So that takes us to approximately 13 minutes into the presentation. The contents continued here. So we define frequency distributions, use of tally charts and grouping data. We outline the use of histograms, define class boundaries, class widths and the class interval. And then at 27 minutes into the presentation, we review continuous distributions, frequency curves, community frequency curves, interquartile ranges, and finally you're left with some questions if you want to attempt those at 44 minutes into the presentation. Statistics is the science of collecting and analyzing data in the form of groups of numbers. Statistics is often represented in terms of tables and diagrams. Analyzing statistics using the results is an essential activity of an engineer. For example, taking samples of factory production to monitor quality control. Displaying information. This section will look at some basic ways of presenting data to an audience. Suppose that in a particular factory, we have a number of persons employed in various job categories, as stated in the table below. So in this engineering company, we have categories of operators, machinists, fitters, administration staff, and design engineers. Looking at the frequency, we have 80 operators, 280 machinists, 240 fitters, 160 administration staff and 40 design engineers. When we total the frequencies, we get 800. So the total, or if you like, the population of the company is 800 staff. If we want to present that in terms of percentages, which is a common way of presenting information, we simply take the number of people in these categories, so for operators 80, we divide it by the total people working at the company, the population of 800, and we multiply by 100 to get percentages. So it's cancelling down, 80 upon 800 is one upon 10, so one upon 10 times 100 gives 10%. So 10% of the workforce are operators. If we look at machinists, there are 280 machinists working at the company, so 280 divided by the population of 800, again times 100, factors down to seven upon 20, times by 100 gives us 35%. 35% of the people at the company are machinists. I will let you fill in the remaining tables there for fitters, administration staff, and design engineers. The answers are shown below. The pie chart. This is another method used to express the information on the previous slide associated with the various job categories of the company. So the pie chart displays proportions as angles or sector areas. Don't forget to complete a circle. We need 360 degrees. So 360 degrees relates to the total number of people employed or the population. If we take the category of machinists on the previous slide, we saw there were 280 machinists out of the 800 people employed at the company. This time we do not multiply that ratio by 100 as we did with percentages. We multiply it by 360 degrees because there are 360 degrees in a circle. So 280 divided by 800 gives us 0 0.35. So 0 0.35 times 360 degrees is 126 degrees. And that relates to this section here on machinists. If we look at design engineers category, there were 40 design engineers at the company out of the 800 staff. So multiplying 40 upon 100 by 360, we will get 18 degrees. So 18 degrees are design engineers. I'll let you calculate the other sectors for the various job categories. The answers are given here. 
the bar chart. Bar charts are used to display discrete or qualitative, that's non-numerical data, for example, colors. The bar chart shown in the figure two shows that heights are used to convey the proportions. The total height of the diagram in this particular case represents 100%. So each of these sectors here represent percentages to a scale that leads to a total of 100%. Horizontal and vertical bar charts. These allow us to provide an improved comparison between the various types of category or people employed in this case. This is a horizontal bar chart where on the vertical axis we have the various categories of the jobs and on the horizontal axis we have the frequency or on the vertical bar chart we have the categories on the horizontal axis and we have the frequency on the vertical. Both used for comparative purposes. Pictogram. This sort of chart is, does not necessarily provide actual specific numbers, but is used for showing typical values and general trends. The pictorial effect provides for a satisfactory visual comparison using a number of small pictures of all the same sizes and arranging them in a bar chart format. They're called a pictogram. Figure 5 uses a pictogram to show historical comparisons of tractors on farms after the Second World War. No scale is used, but as all the pictures have the same size, and since each picture represents one million tractors, approximate numerical values can be read from the chart. So pictograms are useful for getting an overview of a particular quantity. So in 1940, we have one tractor depicted here. If one tractor is worth a million tractors, then we can say in 1940 there were a million tractors on the land. By 1950, we now have two tractors and part of a rear wheel. Now we could say over two million tractors were used on the land, but whether it's 2,200,000 or 2,100,000, that we can't be sure of, but it was over two million. In 1960, we now have what looks like nearly three tractors here, so we would say nominally three million probably just under because the front of the last tractor seems to be missing. In 1962, I think it's safe to say we now have three full tractors, so now we have three million. Again, with 1964, difficult to tell we have three million, but nominally, again, you would say three million. Could be 2,900,000. So you can see from the pictogram, it gives you a general perspective on the quantities without being specific. Okay, let's define variables. Variables are measured quantities, can be expressed as numbers. For instance, a number of cars in a garage, the weights of groups of people, the heights of conifers, etc. In statistics, a variable is sometimes called a variate, especially when dealing with histograms and frequency distributions. Variables can be either quantitative, that's numerical, like the number of aircraft, an airport, or they can be qualitative, like non-numerical, like types of rivet, months of the year, etc. Discrete variables. Some variables can only be stated in certain values, usually but not always whole numbers, and they're called discrete values. For example, number of cars in a garage, number of fish in a tank, number of people working in an office. It's not usually possible to have parts of people, 21.6 say, work in an office, doesn't make any sense. Shoe sizes are discrete because although not always whole numbers, they include half sizes. For example, you have a five, five and a half, six, six and a half, etc. shoe size. You don't have though a 7.19 shoe size or a nine and seven, eight shoe size. That's not normally available. So shoe sizes, like shirt sizes, are classified as discrete. Continuous variables. All other non-exact numbers usually in a range between two stated n values are continuous variables. For example, a continuous variable is a resistance of 
125 plus or minus 0.2 ohms. This means the value of resistance can be anywhere between the end values of 124.8 ohms, the minimum value, and 125.2 ohms, the maximum value. So in other words, 125 take away 0.2 and 125 plus 0.2 gives us the range of values. Another example, dimensional tolerance might be 56 plus or minus 0.1 millimeters. In other words, we mean the value of the dimension can be anywhere between the end values of 55.9 millimeters and 56.1 millimeter. Most measurements in manufacturing technology are continuous and within statistics, these occupy most of our attention. Question one, which of the following are discrete variables and which are continuous variables? I'm going to let you read through this listing and decide whether they're discrete or continuous. The answers are shown over the page, but please have a think about them and try and classify them in your mind, whether they're discrete or continuous. Question one solution here. So here's the answers as to whether on the previous slide the variables were discrete variables or they were continuous variables. So the number of people in the room be classified as discrete. The height of a person be continuous. The age of a person, continuous. The number of people on a train, discrete. Speed of a car, continuous. The number of dresses sold in the shop would be discrete. The number of cars in a car park, discrete. The number of children in a family, discrete. The weight of a person, continuous. The size of men's shirts, discrete. The length of plastic rod being produced in quantity, be continuous. Masses of castings being produced in a foundry would be continuous. Temperature of furnace would be continuous. A number of electric motors produced per day in a factory would be normally discrete. The population. In statistical terms, the population means everything, or maybe everyone, in a category. So in 2001, 21.34 million people watched a situation comedy on a Christmas. How was this figure achieved with confidence? Obviously, the researchers were not sent to every household in the country to find out what people were watching. So what they do is select a sample from the population and then use the results of the sample to estimate the number of people watching out of the population. In this case, the population was the population of the country. What would be the population in table one, referring back to our manufacturing company and the various job categories involved? I'll let you look at that. A factory produces two million ball bearings. What would the population be? Looking back at table one, you'll see that the population, the total number of people employed at the engineering company was 800. The population of ball bearings we're talking about would be 2 million if that was the total number produced. Sampling. So it's really possible to examine all items in a population, whether that's going to be the population of the country or the number of items produced on a mass production line. So we must use sampling. For the information obtained to be of value, the sample must be representative of the population as a whole. So a sample may relate to a hundred ball bearings and we may measure their diameters. The results obtained would be then regarded as being representative of the population as a whole. Frequency distributions. So the following readings relate to diameters of the sample of 100 ball bearings. We've got 100 values in this table. Now the values do not mean very much as they're listed. So we need to rearrange them into what we call a frequency distribution. And to do that, we're going to use a tally chart. So we're going to use a tally chart to try and make some semblance of order of the information on the previous slide, the 100 ball bearings that were measured. What we notice when we scan the 100 ball bearing dimensions is that certain numbers crop up quite often. And these numbers are down here, the measurements. 
so 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, 5 etc., up to 6.4, they were common numbers. They occurred more than once on our previous slide. So what I'm going to do is use a tally chart to try and collate the information and then begin to make some sense of, of the table. So I filled some of the categories in for us. So 5.6, I noticed on the previous slide there were two ball bearings having that dimension, so the frequency was two. The 5.8 diameter ball bearings, there were 11 items that had that dimension. 5.9, I counted 20 ball bearings. 6.1, I counted 21 and 6.3 I counted 8. I'm going to let you now fill in the table and try and find out the frequencies for the ball bearings having a diameter of 5.7, 6, 6.2 and 6.4 millimetres. The results are shown over the page. So continue our frequency distribution for the 100 ball bearings. Here's the final table of the tally of all the diameters we found in the table. To check your values, it should add up to 100. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Group data. We've got a large quantity of data. We often group this into classes or categories. Is then possible to determine the number of items belonging to each class and obtain a class frequency. Grouping helps provide a clear picture of the distribution that's found. The number of classes chosen depends on the amount of original data, but do note that too many groups will destroy the pattern of data and too few will destroy the detail contained in the original data. So it's a judgment call to some extent and the experience required to decide how many categories you need in your particular problem. The histogram. Histograms are used when discrete data has a large range or the data is continuous. Now a histogram has a set of rectangles whose areas, and that's the key thing here, areas are proportional to the frequencies, not the heights, but the areas. So a histogram must be continuous on a horizontal scale. Each column will have its base and its class interval. There will be no spaces between the columns because we're looking at continuous data. If all the class widths are the same, which is usually the case, although it doesn't have to be, the heights of the rectangles represent the frequency. If they're not the same and the areas represent the frequency, then on the vertical axis we plot frequency density, not frequency. So be aware of that. Know that the left-hand edge of a rectangle represents what's called the lower class boundary and the right-hand edge of a, a rectangle represents the upper class boundary. So for this category here, we're talking about here, then this point here is what's called the lower class boundary and this point here is the upper class boundary. The histogram is the best type of diagram to display continuous data. What we're going to do now is show how we can take the discrete data from the ball bearing tally chart and put it into a histogram. And the above in figure seven there shows you a histogram of the tally data we had. OK, what we're going to do now is take the discrete data that we had in our tally chart of the ball bearing sample and we're going to make it into continuous data because the ball bearing data, the diameter of the ball bearings off of the production line is actually continuous data. The tally chart suggests it's discrete data because we have discrete categories of diameters 5.6, 5.7, 5.8 up to 6.4. It looks like we only have ball bearings of those diameters. But of course, in reality, this is a production line and the data would be continuous between the minimum and maximum diameters of the production run. Maybe in this particular case, the reason why it looks discrete is because they only measured a ball bearing diameter to one decimal place. Had they measured to two or certainly three decimal places, then maybe every dimension of the 100 ball bearings in the sample would be different. So what we're going to do here is take the discrete data from the tally chart and we're going to make it into continuous data 
on a histogram. So what's shown below is the bar chart data, the data from the tally chart. Because at the moment it looks like we cannot have, say for example, uh, a 5.75 damageable bearing or a 5.8215 band. We cannot have that because it's discrete, but we know that's not true. So we're going to take this bar chart information and we're going to turn it into a histogram. So first of all, I'm plotting my bar chart. So each of these are the bars that represents the frequencies from the table. So 5.6, we have two items. 5.7, we have four. 5.8, we have 11, and so it goes on. So this is the bar chart information, and each of these bars represents the discrete data in the tally chart. So I've got my frequency plotted over here, F on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis, I've got my diameter D in millimeters for the variation. OK, what we're going to do now is construct a histogram from the bar chart data on the previous slide. You can see I've still got the red bars shown on this diagram, but I've now merged the bars. These dashed lines are where I'm merging the bars into continuous data on my histogram. What I do is go to the midpoint between each of the categories, so 5.6 to 5.7, 5.7 to 5.8 and I actually merge the bars between that position so in other words the difference between 5.6 and 5.7 5.7 5.8 is always 0.1 so I'm going in this case 0.05 forward and behind the category so in other words that 5.7 category I will go forward 0.05 and back 0.05 as I merge the bars so this forms a what's called a histogram by merging the bars. I'll let you look at this and try and understand how we're performing this exercise. What you're doing slowly is making this uh, histogram shape for our diagram. What we end up with is continuous data from, on the left-hand side, 5.5, 5, okay, so each of the bars have been merged by moving 0.05 forward and 0.05 back uh, from the bar. This slide shows the finished histogram where we have now continuous data from on the left hand side from 5.55 right through to the right hand side of 6.45. It's continuous between those extreme values. I've shown how to calculate the intermediate points here between the bars. Uh, for this point here, it's basically 5.8 plus 5.7 divided by 2 gives you 5.75. So we'll use the bars eyes aside if you like, the original bars I added them up and divided by 2. And then for this point up here, I'll show you this one here, I've added the 6.1 to the 6.2, divided that by 2 to get 6.15, which is this position here. Okay, so this is how I find the intermediate points between the original bars uh, for my histogram. I've still got frequency on the left hand side and I've got my diameter on the horizontal axis. Notice I haven't used frequency density here uh, because the increments of each of the bars is the same value. So if the increments are the same, we can then have frequency on the vertical axis. If the increments of the bars were different, some were twice as big as twice as wide as another one, we could not plot frequency on the vertical axis. We would have to plot frequency density. And this is shown in a later example. class boundaries. On the previous figure, figure 7 on the previous slide there, the measurement of 5.8, the original discrete bar uh, that we got from our tally chart, is between now the value of 5.75 millimetres and 5.85 millimetres. This is a class that's represented now by the lower class boundary of 5.75 millimetres and the upper class boundary of 5.85 millimetres. You can see for each of the categories, the original bars, there will be uh, upper and lower class boundaries for each of the uh, categories. Class widths is defined as the upper class boundary take away the lower class boundary. So on the previous slide, looking at the class widths of 5.85 take away 5.75, it's 0.1 millimeters. If you look at the next class on the previous slide, the lower class boundary was 5.8. 85 millimeters and the upper class boundary was 5.95 millimeters. Again, the class width was 0.1. 
And that was the same for all the classes. And that's why frequency was plotted on the vertical axis instead of frequency density. OK, class intervals. If a set of data ranges from, say, 142 millimetres to 142.64 millimetres, and it consists of 16 class intervals, then the class interval is calculated by this formula. Class interval is the range of the data divided by the number of class intervals. So in this case, the range is going to be 142.64 take away 4.2, all divided by 16. That gives us a class interval of 0 0.04 millimetres. So if we take the first class interval, it includes all the values from 142.00 millimetres up to 142.04 millimetres, we write it like this. 142.00 millimetres is less than or equal to x, and x is less than 142.04. In other words, we exclude from this category the 142.04, but every other value between that range is included. The second class interval would include all the values from 142.04 millimetres up to 142.08. We would denote that as 142.04 is less than or equal to x, and x is less than 142.08. So again, we exclude the final value of 142.08 from that category. Just returning to figure 7 for a moment, the ball bearing sample and the histogram we generated from the discrete data is shown here for convenience. What we have, if we take a category here, this category is 5.75 to 5.85. We have the lower class boundary, as it's termed, as being 5.75 millimetres, and the upper class boundary in this particular case of 5.85 millimetres. If I move to the next category here between the 5.85 and 5.95 category, then the 5.85 value will become the lower class boundary and the 5.95 millimetres dimension will be the upper class boundary for the next category. Hopefully you get the idea of how the lower and upper class boundaries are denoted. As I said, in this case, on the previous slide, all the class intervals are 0.1 millimeters and that's why we could plot frequency on the vertical axis. This example looks at continuous distributions. What we've got here is a frequency of tree heights in meters and a tabulated below we've got to draw the histogram. Now what we're given here is classes and frequencies or tree heights in this case. So we've got a class of one to two meters where we've got six trees in that category 3 to 6 metres, we've got 30 trees in that category, 7 to 9 metres, uh, 27 trees in that category, 10 to 11 metres, 28 trees, and so it goes on. What you notice, though, from this information is essentially it's bar chart information. What we're given is bar chart values because there are gaps between the categories. For example, I cannot have a height of 2.5 metres. It doesn't fit in a category. Or I couldn't have a, a tree of 6.3 metres or 11.9 metres. It doesn't make any sense to the categories I've got. I cannot fit them in there. Which, of course, doesn't really make any sense to the problem because heights of conifers, heights of trees should be continuous data. So what we're going to do is draw this into a histogram, which is for continuous data. But note in this particular data, there are varying class widths. So from the tabulated calculations, we need to work out the histogram by plotting the frequency density against the height. So in this case, you'll see on the diagram, the vertical axis is no longer frequency, it's frequency density. And the horizontal axis is the height. And that's because the class widths are all different. So taking the class boundaries above, I've got a class boundary of 0.5 uh, is less than or equal to x, which is less than 2.5 meters so i've gone to a, a a halfway house if you like between the two and the three meters i've called that 2.5 meters so i'm going from 0 0.5 to 2.5 i've gone 0.5 beyond the two so i go 0.5 to the left of the one to get the 0 0.5 for the next category i've got i'm going to go from the 2.5 meters up to 6.5 which is the midpoint between six and seven meters 
for the next category I go from 6.5 up to 9.5 because 9.5 is the midpoint between the 9 and the 10 meter in the category. I go then from 9.5 to 11.5 11.5 is between 11 and 12 and then I go from 11.5 to 14.5 okay again 14.5 is between 14 and 15 on my categories and I go from 14.5 to 15.5 I go 0.5 to the right hand side of the 15 because at the beginning of the diagram I went 0.5 to the left hand side of the uh, one so those are my now class boundaries and that's now continuous I've made the data continuous from the original discrete data given in the table above so when you work out the class width now in this particular case it will be 2.5 take away 0.5 is 2 in this case it's 6.5 take away 2.5 is 4 9.5 take away 6.5 is 3 and so it goes on class width of 2 3 and 1 in the end so now to work out the frequency density, the vertical axis, I divide the frequency by the class width to get the height. So 6 divided by 2 gives me 3. And that will be the height on the frequency density axis. For the next category, I divide the 30 frequency for the second category, divide that by the class width of 4. And that gives me a 7.5 frequency density value. So that would be up here. For the next category, I divide the 27 for the frequency divided by the uh, width of the class, which is 3. So I get 9. So this would be up here. This is 9 for this particular uh, class here. And so it goes on for all the other frequency density calculations. So now, with this histogram, it's the areas of the bars that relate to the frequency. Going back to the calculations again, if I wanted to work out the frequency for this category here, I would have to work out the area under the bar, which would be the class width, which is 2, multiplied by the frequency density, which is 3, which then gives me a value of 6, which is the number of trees that are in that category of a height 1 to 2 metres. Okay, so this is a histogram plotted where we have varying class widths, so the areas of the histogram now become the frequency and we must plot frequency density on the vertical axis i'll let you consider that slide and go through the calculations again in your own time so this exercise i leave you to try it's got the height in centimeters here of 100 small conifers we've got to draw up a tally chart they've given you an idea of the classes to use here originally okay this will form discrete data so you're going to tally the information and then draw a bar chart from this and then you're going to construct a histogram from the bar chart information and you're going to state the class boundaries and the class width uh, for the histogram. So a very similar kind of process you've done on the previous examples. I will leave that with you. Okay, frequency curves here. What we're going to do here is find the midpoint of each of the categories we're given. And we're going to plot a point on the midpoint and we're going to draw a curve through all the midpoints to give us a nice smooth what's called frequency curve. For example, taking the information in the table here, we've got resistance in ohms and we're given some categories. So 7.8 to 8 ohm category, 8.1 to 8.3 ohm category, 8.4 to 8.6 ohm category, etc. What we're going to do is work out the midpoints for each of the categories. So for the 7.8 to 8 ohm category, the midpoint is 7.9. For the 8.1 to 8.3 category, the midpoint is 8.2. The 8.4 to 8.6 category, the midpoint is 8.5. So it goes on. We're also given a frequency for each of the categories. So we've got four resistors in the first category, uh, 19 in the second, 45 in the third, and so that goes on. So looking at my figure here, what we're going to do is find these points in each of the categories. So it's 7.9 for the first category, that's the midpoint, and a frequency of 4, I can find that point there. For the second category, for the midpoint of 8.2 and the frequency of 19, I can find that point there. For the third category, the midpoint is 8.5 and the frequency is 45, I can find that midpoint there. 
and so I can do the same for the other categories. All we do to draw a frequency curve is now put a nice smooth curve through the points and join at the dots basically. Give us our shape. Often the shape is of a bell that like that's shown there. So that's a frequency curve, literally joining at the midpoints on our bar charts or histograms. Okay, we're going to look at a cumulative or running total frequency distribution, sometimes called an OGIV. This is an alternative method of display, and it's used, for example, when we're required to show the number of components or the grades, etc., that are less than a certain value. A cumulative frequency distribution is obtained by adding the frequencies of each successive class to the total frequency of the lower classes. You'll see what we mean by that in an example in a moment. The community frequency of each class is then plotted against the upper class boundary of that class and the points are again joined with a nice smooth curve to form what's called the community frequency or OGIV curve. Okay, in this example here, we've got results of 80 compression tests on concrete cued specimens that were undertaken. And the results are shown in the table. For example, the 8.7 newton millimeter strength, we had five of the cubes fed at that strength level. At the 8.8 .8 newton millimeter strength level, nine cubes failed. 8.9, 19 cubes failed, and so it goes on. What we've got to do is plot a community frequency uh, distribution diagram and then we've got to use it to find the number of cubes having a crushing strength below 8.9 newtons per meter squared, uh, the median crushing strengths, and then the upper and lower quartiles and the interquartile range. Okay, so what we're going to do now is produce a table of the community frequencies corresponding to the upper class boundary. So don't forget that's the boundary, if you like, on the right-hand side of a category. So taking 8.7 to 8.8, .8, the class boundary, the upper class boundary for the 8.7 category is 8.75. So we would term that as not more than 8.75 newton newtons per meter squared. We have five in our community frequency. In other words, five cubes have strengths less than 8.75 newtons per millimeter squared. And our next category, our next upper class boundary is 8.85. That's between the 8.8 .8 and the 8.9 categories. So the upper class boundary is 8.85. And not more than 8.85, we now have 5 plus 9, rather than the frequencies up here. We have 14 cubes that have strengths less than 8.85 newtons per millimeter squared. Looking at our next upper class boundary, we now have 8.9. So not more than 8.95, we have 14 plus the 19, new category there. So we have 33 cubes have strengths less than 8.95 newtons per meter squared. Next upper class boundary is 9.05, so not more than 9.05 newtons per meter squared strength level. We now have 33 plus the 25 equals to 58 cubes have strengths less than at the 9.05 newtons per meter squared. Next category, the upper class boundary is 9.15. So not more than 9.15 newtons per meter squared. We have 58 plus the 18 is equal to 76 cubes have strengths less than 9.15 newtons per meter squared. And finally, going to my uh, final Upper class boundary, this would be to the right of the 9.2 category. So it's 9.25, so 0.05 to the right of it. So not more than 9.25 uh, newtons per meter squared. We finally have 76 plus the four, we have the 80. So 80 items, all 80 items in this case, have a strength less than 9.25 newtons per meter squared. So that's how we produce a community frequency. Uh, table and we'll show over the page how to draw a community frequency diagram and then how to use it uh, as the question requires.
punitive frequency question continued here. What we're going to do now is plot the information on the previous slide of the punitive frequency on a diagram. On the vertical axis of the diagram, we will have community frequency. On the horizontal axis, in this case, we have crushing strengths in newtons per millimeter squared. We're now going to plot the points from the previous table at the upper class boundaries. So the first point is plotted at 8.75. The second point from our table plotted 8.85. Third point from our table plotted 8.95. And so it goes on. We plot all the points at the upper class boundaries. If we put a curve through that, we will get a smooth curve and it's of the form of an S shape. And all community frequencies are of the form of an S. If you look at a frequency diagram, they tend to form a bell shape, but a community frequency is an S shape. So what we've got here is a smooth curve called an O give. What we're going to do now is answer the questions from the previous slide. So part A. Part A wants us to read off the frequency associated with the stress level of 8.9 newtons per meter squared. So what we do to find this is on the horizontal axis, we find 8.9 newtons per meter squared. We project a line up until it hits the diagram, and then we draw a line horizontally across and read off the frequency. The frequency in this case is equal to 22. So that indicates that 22 cubes have a strength below 8.9 newtons per meter squared from our diagram. Part B, we're asked to find the median strength of the curve. And that corresponds to half the total frequency. So in other words, the total frequency is 80 in this particular case. So half of that is 40. So what we do this time is on the vertical axis, we start at 40, half the total frequency, and we draw a line horizontally across until it hits our S curve, and then we draw a line down. And that gives us a value of around about 8.98 newtons per meter squared. So at the median value of our frequency, the strength value here is 8.98 newtons per meter squared. Part C wants us to find the quartiles. So we've got to divide the frequency into four. So in this case, it means finding a quarter of 80, a half of 80, and three quarters of 80. Note that the second quarter in this case coincides with the median we've already looked at. The lower quartile, or the first quartile, relates to a frequency of 20. That's a quarter of 80. So in this particular case, on our diagram, we start on the vertical axis here at 20 for our frequency. We draw a line across till it hits the curve and then read down. And we would find in this particular case, the crushing strength value is 8.89 newtons per meter squared. So that's the lower quartile value. The higher quartile value, or the third quartile, is at a frequency of 60, which is three quarters of 80. This is a 60. So now on our diagram, we go up to 60 up here. And we draw a line horizontally across until it hits our S curve and then a line down. It hits the crushing strengths. We would find that value is 9.06 newtons per meter squared. So that's the upper quartile value. Finally, part D wants us to find the interquartile range. Now that's the difference between the upper quartile value and the lower quartile value. So in this particular case, in part C, the upper quartile strength is 9.06 newtons per millimeter squared, and the lower quartile strength is 8.89 newtons per millimeter squared. Taking one from the other, we get 0.17 newtons per millimeter squared. So we've now used our community frequency curve to answer the questions posed to us. OK, I'm going to leave you with some questions here to look at. Um, I would suggest you go through the questions. Uh, the answers where appropriate are given uh, in the brackets on the right hand side. Questions two and three here. Questions four, five, six here. 
question 7, question 8. And question 9 and question 10. All these questions refer to the previous information on the slides of this presentation. For your reference, a bibliography is shown here that was used to help compile the presentation. And I hope it's been of interest to you. Thank you for viewing.